Hello. Yes, Stephen, you there? Yes, yeah, others, I'm there. Are we back? So sorry about that, man. And sorry to our listeners. Uh, maybe it's because so many people have tuned in. But uh, I got completely disconnected there. I was actually explaining that it was possibly your bad connection there, Stephen. But I, <laughs> I take it all back. I got kicked off completely. I don't understand that. So sorry to everybody. And um, we basically got dropped off. You were talking about when Janice Olstead, not Janice Olstead, what am I saying? Jill Marcus. Um, yes. was imposing different policy to, to get rid of you. Sorry about that, man. Yes. And they wanted to get rid of anyone whom that, that, that don't uh, like. Um, so of, of the 15 directors on the, on the board, the Reserve Bank, there are three are deputy governors, one is a governor, and then the 11 remaining are non-executive directors, four nominated by government, and then the other seven are elected by shareholders. Uh, it, well, Okay, Faiz, are you still with me now? Hello? Guys? Yes, yes, I'm here, I'm here. Yeah, sorry, I don't know, now I've seemed to have lost, I've seemed to have lost Stephen now again. No, no, I'm here. Are you there? Sorry, but we just lost you there for a second, sorry, man. Oh, okay. There there seem to be gremlins in the system, you know. Um, I don't know, it's it's basically on our Skype call, it's not holding up so lacquer. But um, do continue, Let's, let's persist. Right, so that, that, that is the, the situation today. It's, it's very difficult to, to become a director, and uh, they screen you, and um, obviously they only want people who are, what I should say, are not mamparas, but uh, people who uh, will toe the line and, and not uh, um, question anything. Or not cause a stir. No. <laughs> okay, Veronica says... Can Stephen close all his other programs running? Ex- example, email, it might help. That is very true. But uh, there, I seem to have lost both of them. The whole call just just died on me. Um, sorry about this, guys. And, you know, we try to bring you good talk radio, but uh, it's not always as straightforward as that. We sometimes have some issues. So, yeah, as he was basically saying there, it's not as straightforward as it used to be when um, getting involved with something like the Reserve Bank. I mean, I'll 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 say that just this week, I actually had a client ask me to go and do some shots of the Reserve Bank. And the guys outside obviously came to me as they do in most public spaces because this is what I do. I take pictures. I make pictures and they move. Um, I'm just, I am trying to get these guys back in the background. Um, my connection seems to have dropped off again. So sorry, I don't understand this. Um, Sorry about this, guys. What can I say? I've got some things to sort out here. But like I was saying, I was trying to take some shots of the Reserve Bank, and uh, I got shooed away, and I told the guy, is this not, uh, does this place not belong to us? Am I not allowed to take a shot of it? And he was like, yeah, yeah, it's... um, Belongs to us, but it's a uh, national key point. That's why you can't take uh, a shot of it. So when dealing with all things around uh, places like the Reserve Bank. Um, okay. Are you gentlemen back with me? Julia. Yes, Logistics are crazy. Yeah. Lovely, man. Sorry about this, guys. I've been apologizing to the guys. Um, but somehow we're not, uh, our connection's not lasting this evening. But to do remember, if you're having trouble connecting, this is also available as a podcast. We'll podcast this, but the idea of being live is so that we can have live interaction with our guests like Veronica. She she made some suggestion there, Stephen. She says, if you try and turn off some of your programs running on your computer, like email and stuff, and maybe this line yes. will hold up. So, yeah, let's get back into it. Um, we are, We're going to persist as long as we can. Um, if, but if we continue to have these issues, then maybe you just have to tune in for for the podcast. So, apologies once again, gentlemen. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Stephen. Yes. No. I, I think that that sort of wraps up that question. No. What, what's the next one? Oh yeah. So you, you so you said, Stephen, that they they choose people who are basically yes men. Uh, they basically agree to everything. They don't question. You know practices that's going on at the Reserve Bank. And if you start to do that, then you are not one of the uh, 
not one of the team and they kick you out. Is that correct? Is that the kind of culture that exists at the yes. Reserve Bank? Um, they do, when they do select people, um, you have to have certain qualifications. Like they, there's one director who has to have a knowledge of agriculture. And then they have several have to have, for the auditing uh, committee, they obviously have to have an accounting experience. So they do draw people for their specialist skills. Uh, but uh, when it comes to the actual running of the bank, uh, that's where everything uh, comes down, falls down. Because while I was there, all the non-executive directors had very little knowledge of how the banking system actually works. Well, that's a shocking <laughs> uh, revelation there. I mean, if you're part of the banking system, you should really, or if you're a non-executive director, even a director, you should know how banks work. But I must be quite honest with you, I came across a professor who also <laughs> didn't actually know how the money creation system works, actually. He had a completely different idea of how it re works in reality. But I want to come back to what we said at the beginning, Stephen. We said, you know, that the, the, the Reserve Bank, the central banking system, in fact, the financial system is a scam. Yes. Now, would you agree with that, Stephen? Would that be a fair thing to say? Yes. Uh, the thing is, what, 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 uh, let's just go a little back in history just to, say, to explain to the listeners how, how it all started. Uh, I mean, the, the, first, well, the first major central bank was the Bank of England in 1694. And by the turn of the 20, 20th century, we had 18 central banks, uh, mainly located in Europe, and there were one or two others in Japan and Indonesia. Uh, and then after the First World War, there was a huge increase in the number of central banks. And the, uh, there was a meeting held in, in Italy in 1922 where they stipulated that all these new central banks must be independent of government. In other words, they would be working for and on behalf of the private banks and government must not interfere. And they, in fact, are almost a, a, an independent power. Mm -hmm. And so the South African Reserve Bank was yeah. started one year before 1921. And... Uh, it's, it was modeled on the, on the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank, but with the difference that uh, it uh, delegates the creation of money to the private banks. And what right. it, it hands out licenses to the commercial banks, and um, they uh, create the money supply when someone borrows uh, money from them. So, for so, example... So they are the credit facility that everybody talks about? Yes, well, the Reserve Bank can create money itself, but they, don't, they do it on a very limited scale. Um, the, what they do, of course, create is uh, the notes and coins. Uh, they, you know, they print and, and, and mint them. But they are uh, form only a very small percentage of the, of the money supply, roughly about 6%. So the other 94% is created by the banks, and they have to lodge reserves which at the, at the Reserve Bank, you know, cash reserves uh, or treasury bonds or whatever. And then they can lend 10 times the amount of reserves that they've uh, left at the bank, at so the Reserve Bank. So fractional reserve lending as we, as we learn in mo modern money mechanics. Yes, but, but they don't teach you that at university. That's why that professor doesn't know how the money uh, supply where it or, or originates. But you know what? Right. There's a lot of guys that even work in a bank today, okay? And I, and, I, and I was actually chatting to one of them on the weekend. And, I mean... I, I, let's not, I obviously won't divulge names or whatever. They, they, they're not allowed to speak on behalf of the bank. But as far as this guy knows, he says the bank doesn't bring any money. It can't bring any money into circulation that's not there. So he's basically saying that they are not, and like from, from my experience with, 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 with banks and lending, um, they always refer to this, this, this credit facility, which is not them. And as far as we understand, when we trace it with like securitization and stuff, the bank is not actually the lender of the money. So we naturally assume then that the Reserve Bank is the person that's allowed to conjure the money. And I mean, going back to like one of what, what, our, what our, one of our listeners asked um, on Facebook, even she says we should ask about the birth certificates and if you have any knowledge about that. And as far as a lot of people are concerned, or a lot of people's understanding goes, that the Reserve Bank kind of. Uh, so gives us a money supply based on the 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 the, the chattel, the, the the it's you know it's um, assets being us, the citizens. So they we, we we I've I've got this understanding that the Reserve Bank is the one that's bringing all the money into to into existence, and the banks no. actually also have that kind of extended license to also bring more money into existence through the Reserve Bank because I mean. Someone like Nedbank gives reference to a credit facility, you know, 
And I, I asked them and I said, is this the Reserve Bank? And the, the guy said, yes, it's the Reserve Bank. Not that anybody actually knows what's going on with banking. And this is why we have to discuss it, because we need to get to the core. We need to get to a good understanding of how this all works. Yes, the, 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 it's not correct to say that the Reserve Bank creates the money. It, it does in, in the United States. The, the, the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank plays a, a large role in, in creating money, which it lends back to government. But in South Africa's case, the money is all. The 94 percent of the money in circulation has been created by uh, commercial banks. And uh, a common example is, is when you apply for a home loan. Uh, the assumption, which you will read in your uh, school or your university textbook is that the um, the bank takes uh, let me say half a million rand from someone's savings account and then he transfer they transfer that money into your loan account your, your bond account and of course that's not true all they do is they um, they give you the right to to draw that amount of money and that money that, that becomes a loan you now have five hundred thousand rand and that reflects as a uh, asset in their books. And then obviously they have to create the liability. So they just create that in their books. And now this freshly created money is uh, in your account and you can go and spend it, buy your house or make repairs or whatever. But this, <coughs> this is fresh money. And the, the big liability, uh, the big drawback is that you're gonna, now going to have to pay interest and interest on interest. And that is why we have inflation because when they created that loan for your house, they didn't allow for the interest that has to be paid. So additional loans eventually have to come into circulation and it's not matched by any productivity or any labor. And that's why we have inflation. Yeah, well, that money creation process at the commercial bank level, I mean, I think a lot of people are now starting to get familiar with that. The fact that, in fact, banks don't have money, they're not intermediaries, they don't lend out savers money. Borrowers are not given the money that savers deposit at the banks. In fact, the borrowers themselves really create the money. It's not really even the banks that are doing that, because without the signature of the borrower, you know, the banks can't create those deposits. So so that's quite, I think, I think more and more people are starting to understand that, that Banks don't actually lend money because a loan is something completely different to what they understand it to be uh, in terms of banking. But coming back to the central banks, now you see they only create about 6% of the money in circulation. So if government wants to borrow money, my understanding was that government goes to the central bank, borrows how many billions it needs, and then uh, has to pay back that loan with interest over time. So where does government get its money from if the central bank doesn't print money to lend to government, uh, Stephen? It goes into the uh, capital markets and uh, the issues of prospectus. They want uh, one billion at seven and a half percent. And that is a, and the people then uh, institutions like uh, life insurance companies, uh, short term insurers, they then subscribe to those loans. And it's all existing money. Money that's been already created is used uh, in order to finance government's uh, uh, borrowings. And then they pay interest to the bondholders. It could be private individuals, institutions, pension funds, and that type of thing. So it's all existing money. But now, <coughs> excuse me, if we had a, a state banking system, the Reserve Bank would... Uh, supply government to all, with all its needs for infrastructure, for, for building roads and bridges and dams and like for Eskom. And it would just charge a small handling fee. Maybe it would be interest, but maybe a quarter of a percent or half of a percent just to, uh, to cover the cost of, all, of, of the transactions. And that money would be, would be interest free and it also mean it would be inflation free. But uh, it has been done in the past. And those countries which have introduced that system, they, they've then been taken down. They, they declare a war, like in World War II. The, the, there were three countries who were using that system, Germany, Italy, and Japan. And that's why we had World War II. World War I, Russia had a state bank. And that's why we had to have a war in order to take Russia down. And uh, it, it's happened throughout history. Uh, even, like Napoleon, he, he set up a state bank, and that's why we had all the Napoleonic Wars. They did entirely different reasons in the history books. But that, that is the, the, the sort of dynamic force throughout the last 300 years. It's all, 
the, the bankers are continually protecting their, their system. And they don't mind killing hundreds of millions of people. It doesn't matter. They want their system to remain in perpetuity. I see. Okay. So government debt is then basically <coughs> uh, owned by not mainly the, the Reserve Bank, but by private entities, as you said, That's insurance right. companies, etc. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but the, as I said, this is money which has been created by the banks themselves. It's circulating. The commercial banks, not yes. obviously, yes. yes. And, but you also got to remember that whenever money gets paid back, it gets destroyed. Mm -hmm. So they have to, the banks are continually encouraging people to borrow. Because if you don't borrow, the money supply is going to shrink and you're going to have a slump. And that's why we have a lot of unnecessary growth in order to, uh, to keep the, the loans uh, um, repeating themselves. And that's yes. one of the reasons why they have um, they've, they've boosted uh, China as, as a producer of goods, goods which are generally not of the same quality or in other countries, so that they, this is a continual consumption and a continual borrowing, because that's the only way the system, system can survive. Well, the system is designed then because it's keeping you in servitude, it's keeping you in slavery. You've got to keep working to pay off money, you know, uh, interest on your loans, basically. Um, and they have to keep on lending out money, or well, not lending, but they have to keep on creating money to keep the system going. And people have to keep on working to pay off money that they don't really owe the bank. So it's a, it's a scam, basically. Yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a slavery system. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, but, yeah, go but, but I wanted to ask you a question. Sorry, Julian. Government raises money through taxation, okay? Mm -hmm. And then obviously the deficit they raise through the means that you said uh, they do. So the... The purpose then of the central bank, the reserve bank, then, besides what you mentioned earlier on, is there any other purpose besides that? <coughs> well, as I mentioned, the reserve bank prints the banknotes, mints the coins. It also provides financial stability. It's a lender of last resort. Uh, you know, when something like someone, a bank like African Bank goes bankrupt, they have to sort it out and bail out the uh, depositors. It also issues uh, statistics and uh, um, you know financial bulletins, and um, and have, we still have what we call exchange control. And you also have what they call the registrar of banks, who has to uh, monitor what the banks are doing all the time that they are abiding by their regulations. So there are quite a number of other functions, but which are not actually connected with uh, with money creation. I think one of them is to protect the value of the currency. Uh, would that would that would that be correct, Stephen? Yes, that, that's in the, the, the three sections in the Constitution, section two two three to two two five, and one of them is to is to uh, protect the value of the, the currency uh, in the interest of sustainable growth. Now, of course, that that, that is a real scam because since 1921, the, the rand has lost 99.5 percent of its value. Exactly. So that, yes. They don't. They don't. Keep, they're not there to protect. It. That's just uh, to just for, for for public consumption. Uh, in fact, they're they because of the system. They are destroying the rand on a daily basis. The value of the rand, and um, about, so so they basically failed the test. I mean, if they said that's what we have to do is to protect the value of the rand, and a few decades later the the rand is really worth way less than what it was when they first started out. Uh, why are they still around, these guys? I mean, they're not doing their job. Well, I mean, that's that's perfectly obvious. But you must remember the the, the, uh, the, the you, you can criticize the Reserve Bank, say, for example, over inflation targeting, or but you you can you will never be able to um, question their existence because the um, my understanding is that the, that the press in this the, the media in this country they. Uh, are advised by a, a, number, a couple of big uh, legal firms, and they tell them, you may not you may not question the, the the existence or the integrity of the Reserve Bank. It's off limits, so it never gets debated. It, I mean, you'll never see it on a TV program. You won't see it in a in a radio show. So you except this one. you were actually you were actually um, like they wanted to arrest you for the book that you published. Am I not? Am I correct? <coughs> Well, they say that I um, I contravene the section um, in the, in the which is that you may not re reveal um, the secrets. Well, not only the secrets, but what the internal the workings inner workings, of the yeah. But 
But uh, that section was only introduced in 1989. The Banks Union legislation started in 1920, and that, that clause was, uh, did not appear. And the reason why it came in 1989, well, that was to cover up the, uh, the gold that was being stolen at that time. And uh, so that was to intimidate the employees not to, uh, to, you know, to leak anything out. Uh, but I mean, the, the point, if, if you are disclosing things that are criminal, uh, that, that, that clause would not cover criminal activity. Uh, so I, you know, I, I don't believe that I'm, I'm uh, subject to it. Okay. Yeah. So, so, I mean, just to let, just to remind everybody once again, we have got some people on our chat room and um, just to remind everybody that you can actually field your questions in the chat room um, or have something to say. Uh, and uh, we'll we'll happily ask uh, Mr. Goodson about those questions and get a response. And um, yeah, we also we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. You can even add us on Google Chat. We are ZA Talk Radio at Gmail, so you can get all of us there as well. Send us emails and give us your your input on this discussion. Something I wanted to know, uh, Stephen, was uh, how long after being in the system. Like, uh, what was your journey like in terms of discovering all this? Is this something you discovered late into your career there? I mean, yeah. is it well, something I, I you slowly discovered or you, you've been looking into and tried to possibly change from the inside? Or how did it go? Well, I've been aware that the banking system has been corrupt now for over 30 years. and um, So even during your participation with the Reserve Bank, was it in yeah, efforts before, to... Yes. Before I joined the bank, I knew that, that the system uh, was a scam. Um, but obviously, when you when you join a new organisation, uh, you have to you know take a back seat and see how the thing you know the system works. And that's, that's exactly what I did. I was just an observer more than anything else. And I did as as I uh, um, became better known. I did try to introduce various changes, uh, including uh, converting the um, Reserve Bank into a state bank. And I, I handed in a 70-page memorandum. And unfortunately, Jill Marcus didn't know what it was all about. So she gave it to a, a, one of the economists. And he said, no, it won't work. So that was the end of it. I, I mean, we couldn't even discuss. I couldn't have it discussed at, 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 in, uh, at a board meeting. So the most a lot, a lot of the people have have high qualifications. Um, there are a lot of ignorant people there who really don't know what's going on. They don't understand the damage that the system does, and of course they are generally very well paid. They've got secure employment, and uh, it's it's unlikely that anyone's going to rock the boat there because um, if you do, you know you you will, you will obviously be dismissed. Yeah. Yeah, crazy you know, they situation say, you we know, found ourselves in. Mm, go for it, Faisal. It's crazy, yeah. Yeah, no, it's crazy. They, I've heard it said that, you know, it's difficult to get a man to understand something if his salary depends on him not understanding it. <laughs> yeah. You know, so you just can't convince people that, you know, this whole system is really dysfunctional, it's criminal, if, you know, they're earning their living in the system. And I think that's the big problem we face. I mean, how do you actually deal with a problem like that? I mean, I don't think it's, it's, it's I don't think one can even deal with it. It's, it's just not possible. People just don't want to hear, you know, the truth because it doesn't really interest them because they earn their living by living in a system which is untruthful and dishonest. Yes, well, they, eventually, uh, of course, this, this system cannot uh, continue forever. Uh, there's been such a, a huge uh, amassing of wealth by a very small percentage of people, and uh, and the bulk of the population have been so impoverished. Uh, eventually, the system will break, and uh, you know we see it now, uh, especially over the last 20 years. Uh, there's been a huge concentration of wealth in very few hands, uh, to the extent that today, according to a um, calculation called the Gini coefficient. Yes which has been in existence since 1912, we have the worst distribution of wealth in the world, of that's, income in the world. That's that correct, is, yeah. That is a shocking indictment. Wait, yeah. When you say we, uh, are you talking about South Africa? South Africa. Yes, right. yes. You know, whereas in the 70s or 60s, 
we actually had a much fairer society in terms of distribution of income. And uh, this system now has actually been uh, almost reinforced. It's been made worse. Yeah. And we see the evidence of it everywhere. I mean, you know, the six million people living in squatter camps and the... Uh, the squatter camps are growing, actually. They're not getting any smaller. No, they're not. And it's affecting everyone. I mean, uh, someone was telling me that it's not only uh, black people. There are about a million white people living in camps now. Uh, so the whole population has been affected by it. And uh, it's just getting worse. And, of course, government just has, are clueless as how to tackle it. Well, the diabolical thing is that this is not something by accident. It's actually by design. It's designed to create exactly the outcomes that we're seeing. I mean, there's no other outcome that can occur in a system that's designed the way it's designed. And so that is the big challenge for everybody who can see what, you know, what the system is all about. But because people's minds are so closed, it's very difficult to even convince the very people that are suffering in the system that the system itself is causing them to be where they are. So that, for me, is the big challenge. How do you actually convince people and, and let them see that, in fact, the system is designed to create exactly what it's doing? Now, you're quite right. You say the system will break. It has to break. It's not sustainable. Uh, but when it's going to break, I don't think anybody knows that. Yeah, uh, but the whole point is that it's designed to do exactly what it's, what it's doing right now. A lot of people, uh, like uh, I personally believe that that uh, when you say when it's going to break, it's like a play that they're timing, you know, they, they're kind of holding all the cards at the moment, these banking cartels. Um, but to come back to our chat room, Veronica there says, hi Steph Stephen, um, we love both your books. You are very brave and true champion of our country. My question may... My, my question, so many South Africans, sorry guys, so many South Africans are desperate because of unemployment and inflation. What's your advice to the average person on the street? How do we fight or survive this? Are there solutions? You know, it's coming from one of our listeners, Stephen. Yes. Look, there's no easy answer to that because we're living in a totally corrupt system where uh, the bankers have complete control of the media. They have complete control of the education system. So uh, we, are, we are being brainwashed into believing that this is actually a normal way of living now. Yeah. Uh, and we've also, yes. we've also been conned into believing that we have a democracy uh, which uh, distributes all the fruits of our labor and so forth. I mean, that is also another scam. But to get yes. back to the point of how to, to survive, look, the, only advice, the best advice I can give you is don't get into debt. Uh, because that is the surest way to... to uh, worsen your situation uh, so um, it's to, it's to <coughs> if you've got a property your first priority is just to pay it off and and and, uh, and, and not be constantly making all these payments yeah uh, but but Stephen the system is designed to keep you indebted to the yes. system I yes. mean it's, it's very difficult to get out of debt I mean, with the taxes, you have to you tax basically in every aspect of your life. You know, you fill up, fill up petrol and you tax. You know, you work and you, you tax. Every part of your life, you tax. So they're taking away from you and, they, and you're earning less. Inflation is taking, making your money worth less. Mm. And so the whole system is designed to keep you indebted. I mean, it's a big, I can understand what you're saying. Mm. You, know, get, you know, minimize your debt, or eliminate your debt. But I mean, that's a big challenge, actually. Um, Yes. Well, the, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't alternative systems be maybe the solution? You know, don't use the current financial system. <coughs> use use community currencies. Yes, you can. You can yeah. do that. I mean, there are you know um, alternatives like uh, let's in the local exchange trading systems, and but these are very dependent on having a uh, community spirit, because yes. they're all based on trust. And yes. if you get one or two people who abuse the system, then the whole thing's going to collapse. So uh, it's very important that. That you that you have a, a spirit of togetherness, and it can work at a sort of very localized level, where you exchange your services and you don't pay interest, you don't pay tax, you don't you know, you don't even transfer money, you just transfer units. Uh, so that can work on a, on a, on a, on a local level, but uh, you know when it comes to um, the overall um, situation, there's, we are very constrained. Uh, and um, the one weapon we can use, and that, that, that is to inform people, to, yeah. s to spread the word that the system yeah. is rot. That's what that we're trying to do. Train. Absolutely. That's exactly because what we're trying to do with like platforms like this. It's just trying to raise awareness and 
make people aware of what's going on. Yeah, sorry, <coughs> go for it, Steve. Yeah. The, the, as I say, the, the education system has been totally corrupted. I mean, you've got all these university professors who don't even know how the money system works. So what I, 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 have, to, I have to agree with you there. Yeah, and of go course, ahead. If, they, if these professors or these lecturers start uh, telling a different story, they're not going to last there long. No. So yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a vicious circle which you, it's very hard to break. Yeah. Um, yeah. But as the, you know, you're, as I say, to, to, to get the word out, I mean, that, is, that has got to be one of the major um, planks of, 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 of trying to change the system. Education, and education, once you've education. Got, yeah, yeah. yeah. One, once you've got a critical mass, then you can really start moving. But until you've got that critical mass, we, when we're just isolated in small groups, then not much is going to happen. Um, and yeah. of course, we can also, I mean, we can still try, well, I don't think it's, it'll be all that effective, is, is to approach your... Uh, the, your, your, your political leaders and, and inform them. Uh, as far as I know, there's only one party that actually uh, advocates the state back, and that's the EFF. Yeah. And so, yeah. Uh, if you've got contacts with the DA or any of the other parties, you should then uh, put pressure on them to change the system. Uh -huh. uh, and it's, and you've, you've, got to, you've got to be active. You can't be just uh, wait for someone else to do it. If you exactly. don't do it, it's not going to happen. Exactly. We can't be passive. We need to take responsibility for ourselves and and move forward, you know. But then we then obviously then the people themselves are responsible for their own uh, situation they find themselves in because they keep voting, you know, parties into power that are keeping them, you know, in servitude <coughs> by, 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 by maintaining the policies that uh, keep the banks in power. Because uh, it's really the banks that, that, that own countries and run countries and not 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 governments, you know, the way I see it. Uh, and so this mind control, this brainwashing, like you mentioned, I think that's where we have to start is to actually, uh, you know, there are ways to, for help, to help people reprogram themselves. But, you know, it pains me every four or five years when, when, when the general elections come around that, you know, the very people that are suffering are going to vote, you know, people into power that uh, that are keeping them in this state of suffering, <laughs> it's like insanity. Well, actually, Faiz, I, I agree with you, but I don't think all of them are voting because the uh, you have to understand that the IEC is probably one of the most corrupt institutions in this country. There's no such thing as a free and fair election in South Africa. Yeah. And uh, I mentioned in the book when we uh, stood for the Ubuntu Party last year, uh, we had tremendous support. Where we had over a thousand field workers, we were really making inroads, and we were banking on at least two MPs, about a hundred thousand votes. Uh, and we knew from the, for example, you know, the overseas uh, uh, votes, people who, uh, who live in converted, overseas can vote at the embassies. And there were 18,000 um, people who voted overseas. And w one of our people attended the count, and we got 4,500 of those votes. Okay. And when we looked at this receipt, you get a scan receipt after all the counting, we found we only had 16 votes. What? <laughs> Yes, they, I mean, the whole thing was rigged, and uh, we knew part of the problem was we, we, we'd put up a huge trailer outside to wait in different parts of Johannesburg saying that the Bank for International Settlements controls the Reserve Bank. It does, yes. And they obviously, they, I mean, it's very easy. You just make a phone call or whatever or a meeting, and we lost all our votes. In the end, we got 8,000 votes. So um, you have to understand that they've been manipulating the, the, the voting since 1994. And... Uh, they're using that, the, the ANC is their sort of uh, um, means for retaining control. I, I would imagine if you had a real proper count, and if you think of what's happened, how things have broken down, how the, you know, the municipalities are not functioning, how the, um, you know, there's no more power and that kind of thing, you'd think that the, that the ANC would probably only get about maybe 30 or 40 percent of the vote. But they get two thirds to every election. And that can only indicate that the vote's been manipulated. So it really, it's, it's very discouraging, you know, if you think you're going to change it to the, through the ballot box. I, I don't yeah. see it happening that way. Yeah, yeah but they also they only, well, they got the percentage they got of the people who voted, but there's a large percentage of people who don't vote. Yeah, lot, so, they, yes. so it's not a percentage of the entire voting no, no, population, no. yeah. No, it's even smaller because you've got to yeah. remember uh, only 85% of the population have registered, never mind voted. And yeah. only another about 70 percent have voted. So in fact, the ANC probably only has about 20 percent of the people supporting them. Yeah, but I mean, it doesn't matter who's in power if they all sort of uh, sing the same tune. 
and continue the same policies, you know, uh, what is, I mean, where does that leave everybody? Yeah. Doesn't the system have to change? Because people think we have a capitalist system, a laissez-faire, free market capitalist system, and, and we have a democracy. But that's, uh, that's not really true, actually. We actually have a corporate capitalist, a corporate fascist system, if you really think about it. It's a fascist corporate system. Yes, or corporate uh, bankism. It's corporate bankism. Let's call it that. That's corporate right. bankism or fascist bankism. <laughs> the country you know? is, is run by the bankers, and and uh, the, the ANC is, is is the party of big business. They support big business, yeah. um, and um, they've been doing that. You know, I mean, if you go right back in history, you know, who financed the Communist Party in 1917? Mm -hmm. who, who paid for all the revolutionaries? It was yeah. the bankers in New York, and it was the yeah. Bank of England. Yeah. Uh, they were channeling all the funds. Now, do you think that they're spending all that money just for uh, because they have a, um, a social goodwill? No, that, that's an investment. And communism was an investment. So to think, and it's there to, to deceive people to think that, they are, that we have a choice, but there is no choice. Um, well, 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 the goal of the New World Order is one world government, so they're obviously rallying all the governments together so that we can all come under one banner, one world government. So it's quite understandable, you know, seeing what we're seeing today. It's just the fact that governments are really not independent entities for a country. They have to answer to higher powers. Let's put it that way. We're all heading towards a one world government. Yes, well, we do have it already in effect. I mean, it just it hasn't been formalized. Um, we see how the, the, the blocks are coming together, the uh, <coughs> North America, NAFTA, and then you have it in... Uh, um, European Union, and you have they want to start an African Union, uh, and then w once all these blocks have been formula uh, cemented, then they all come together. But we have it already. Uh, it's just not uh, it's not just uh, completely apparent. Yeah, no, definitely it's uh, moving very fast in that direction. Uh, but we do have it here to a large degree. You're quite right there, Stephen. But now. What do we do? I mean, we had uh, Dr. Omar Zaid on last week, and he said, you know, there's there's nothing. We, well, he didn't say there's nothing we can do, but he says these people are very powerful. They own everything, really, and really and truly they do. They own the indication system. They own everything. What is the common man in the street to do? Uh, what is your what would be your response be to that, Stephen? Well, in terms of numbers, they're actually very small. They're a tiny group, maybe a few hundred, mm -hmm. and then around that tiny little group, they're surrounded by all the various police forces and armies and NATO and that, that protect them. And then you've got the vast mass of humanity. Uh, so, so we've got the numbers. They haven't got the numbers. And uh, But they've got the expertise and, and, and we don't. Well, yes, they've, 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 they've got the technology. They've got, yes. They probably have stuff that we don't even know about, <laughs> I would imagine, yes. uh, that's keeping them you know, in power. Uh, I think for me on the ground, we have to educate people, you know, make them aware, help them deprogram and then reprogram themselves. I mean, I did that to my own self, quite honestly. I deprogrammed myself yes. and reprogrammed myself. I honestly did that because I realized what I was taught, you know, at university, business school, wasn't in many ways completely wrong. It's deception. Yes. And so if you, you look talking about people, millions upon millions of people walking around with delusions. They deluded. They, they had their whole false beliefs about how the world really works. And that is the big problem that we faced with, actually. Yes. And they, uh, you know, I mean, we did have uh, one example, which is uh, Libya, where uh, Colonel Gaddafi set up a, a wonderful socialist system there, which worked. And yeah. um, he was taken down. Uh, yeah. So, <coughs> yeah, they go the against anybody that tries to do anything for the people. That's like yes. that's that's evident in like books like with the economic hit man and stuff like that as well. But yes. sorry to and cut then, it. Sorry, can I cut yeah. in here for a second? I wanted to ask yeah, a question from one of our um, yeah. one of our listeners, um, and something that I'm also curious about from time to time. If we were to revert back to the gold standard, instead of fiat money, would we would we like alleviate the the, the problem? Would would it would it all go away if money was something once again like gold that's tangible? I don't I don't know. I wonder about it, but I don't think so because of no. The gold standard is another scam, and it worked very well for the people who, who controlled most of the gold. Exactly, but, uh, <laughs> exactly. That's uh, what my argument all is, is all the time. Like yes. only a handful of people pull this stuff out of the ground. Yes, 
Well, it's a bit ridiculous. You know, they, they pull the stuff out of the ground in one place and then they put it in, into another uh, in a, into another vault. I mean, exactly. Just, <laughs> um, I, I remember once reading some of, about the, the German, German Central Bank. Uh, it was, it was the, the governor in, I think in 1940. He said that if, if, uh, if America dropped all its gold into the Pacific Ocean, well, what would happen? The factories would open up the next day. You know, no, nothing was, was going to was, would change. So, <coughs> gold is just a deception. Gold is another fiat currency, basically, that certain well, people pull it, out it, of the <laughs> ground and yeah, the rest of us don't have access to it. No, and it all depends how they set the value and they can manipulate. And that's what they were doing yeah. throughout the 19th century and uh, until it was uh, abandoned, uh, well, eventually it was abandoned in 1971 when Nixon uh, stopped exchanging um, American dollars for, for gold. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't see that as a solution at all. Okay, and then um, I mean, because I mean, he, he gives reference to the fact that Russia and Asia are all trying to basically get hold of their gold again. So yeah, I also don't, I don't, agree, I don't agree with that gold. Well, um, I mean, it, it it might be just a tactical move, uh, maybe to get rid of dollars. Um, yeah. But I I don't see that as a, as a sort of. Uh, uh, forerunner of an introduction to return to the gold standard. And and what are your thoughts on something um, a little bit? I mean, I've got, I've got a lot more questions in our in our chat room. Maybe if I ease you, you can get to reading some of those. Yes, uh, I, I'm actually seeing that. I see Don's quite a few moment, yeah. comments comments there. I actually, but, just asked Don what is PFMPE. Yeah. But uh, I want to I want to just come back to the gold standard. So you think the gold standard doesn't is that doesn't really work? It's a it's another scam, uh, Stephen. Uh, don't you think that the gold standard sort of prevents inflation if you link your currency to gold and you and you say, for example, your, uh, your currency is valued or the gold is valued at, uh, what's it, $35 an ounce or whatever, and then you just can't print, you know, money willy-nilly like happened when, they, when the gold standard was removed. So the gold standard is a, is a type of restraint on money printing and inflation. Would that not be right, uh, Stephen? Well, the, the, the problem is that, the, you know, the, the population of the world... Uh, what, 100 years ago, what was it, uh, 3 billion or even yeah. less. Yeah. Uh, we just don't have the uh, amount of gold to to satisfy the, the amount of money we need to in order to keep the, the world economy going. Okay. So it, right. You'd have to be continually increasing the price. And yes. um, uh, it, it would also it would benefit some and it would also be a, a huge disadvantage to others. Because what, what, what determines the value of a currency is your labor productivity, not how no. much gold you can collect. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, so, so something, I, so would you would you advocate then something a little bit like, like some something for instance like Bitcoin as a, as a... Well, yeah, well that, yeah, <coughs> I mean, Bitcoin's a private venture and it is, it is uh, open to abuse, so I, I don't, you know, I... I it's not actually. It's it's a, it's an algorithm and it's an open ledger and I mean, it, it makes mm -hmm. everybody that's on the system accountable for the system. So I don't know how it's really open for abuse. I mean, the, the guys have definitely used it uh, to to do illegal things because there's the anonym the anonym. Oh, I can never say this word anonymity. What else? Anonymity. 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 Sorry, guys. Sorry. Anonymity that comes yeah. along with it, but um, I don't I don't see what you mean when you when you say it can be tampered with because other 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 parties have been robbed of Bitcoin because they they they're storing Bitcoin for people. But I mean. A concept we like to come back to often here is, is, is sovereignty. And like we always say, with sovereignty comes responsibility. So we need to be responsible for our own finances. And something like Bitcoin does that. It puts the responsibility back on everybody. Yes, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, you, you, probably, need, you probably need a, a national body controlling it. Otherwise, uh, then you get rival Bitcoins coming into circulation. And uh, you, you, don't, you don't have any kind of uniformity. So, it, it, look, it does seem to work on a, on a limited scale, but you know whether it can be, we can actually use it for for trading or international trading. I, I, I somewhat doubt it at this stage. I'm I'm a I'm a big believer yeah. in Bitcoin myself, actually. Um, yeah, but I mean that's a that's another discussion for another day. Um, coming yeah. back to just something that I mean, I was actually t chatting to you about off air there, Stephen was um, when 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 some I think it, it's a recording of of you and a police officer um, when he was trying to um, I think he was trying to arrest you for uh, releasing your book. 
Yes. Was that what was going on? No, it was just a preliminary meeting. Uh, um, he, um, he said he had received this complaint and uh, it will have to be investigated um, by the uh, Department of Special Crimes. Uh, but what happened was that uh, he hadn't read the book. So that, that's why the, the meeting sort of... Uh, Jizzled out. Well, he had, yeah, he, uh, he, he wasn't able to provide any uh, counter-arguments. Uh, so, you know, we were just informing him that, uh, he, he, that his complaints didn't have any foundation. But the fact that he didn't know what it was all about, it was all, you know, uh, <clears throat> poorly prepared on his behalf. Okay. And then, I mean, do you, do you believe that something like um, the fact that the, the, the banks um, and the Reserve Bank has been foreclosed on under UCC is actually a, 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 a legitimate argument for people, you know? Well, it's, it hasn't actually happened yet, so I think until it has happened, we can't really, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, make it a major news item. But it, it yeah. may happen, put it that way. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, we we've got a, a Don has posted a long statement here, and I quite honestly I don't really understand <laughs> most of it. That's why I asked <laughs> you to read it because I was I was struggling <laughs> to get my head around it there. Um, I don't actually I, tr I read it twice now, but I'm not really sure what it's all about. So maybe Don can just maybe very briefly, you know, just restate what he's what he's saying, or if there's any question, you know, that he has, then we can pose that to Stephen. Um, I was planning so on Stephen, taking. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was planning on taking ahead, some. I was planning on taking some calls from my listeners, but um, when we got dropped off, I changed my setup a little bit, and now my I, I cannot take calls anymore because I just uh, yeah my bad. So unfortunately, we won't be having any live calls. So if you do have any questions, the chat room is the place, and let's try and keep it nice and short and concise. Sometimes it's a uh, it's a bit difficult to get I edit on these paragraphs that people submit like this but go ahead please yeah so Stephen obviously you know whenever you're dealing with anything in the world today whether it's healthcare or the law or governments or whatever you got to look at it within the context of, of the new world order because that's what it's all about uh, what is your solutions I mean I know we've spoken about solutions but really fundamentally what are your sort of take home your take home advice for our listeners and everybody else, uh, Stephen, in terms of the solutions for this country in the context of the new world order. And I'm talking about economic financial solutions. Yes, well, you, you don't have sovereignty unless, if you don't have control over the emission of your circulating medium, your money, then you're not a sovereign country. Right. You're, you're, you're bordering on a slave state, and that is the situation in South Africa. In fact, we've been like that since 1652. Right. Uh, you know, nothing has changed. I mean, we've had all these various liberation days and freedom days and what republic days, but actually they really don't mean too much. Um, yeah. we, we've been, been conned into believing that we have freedom, and I think that was one of the objectives, uh, was to, to lull the population into believing that now you've got the vote, shut up. Don't make any more noise. You know, you ask what you wanted for, and I just get on with it. And yeah. I think that's the biggest mistake you make, that you think that we actually have freedom. We don't have freedom, and we've got quite a long way to go before we get it. But the, the, whole, the cornerstone of freedom is having uh, sovereignty over your, over your internal affairs, over your, your economic affairs. And that can only be restored when you control the issue of the, of the circulating medium money. And that would imply the need to have a, a, a state bank, which is run by the Treasury, uh, it can be sort of outsourced to a type of reserve bank for doing certain functions, but uh, the money that comes into circulation must have been created by the state as, as free of debt and free of interest. In that way, then we don't have, then we can drastically reduce taxation because remember, a lot of the taxation goes to paying the interest on government loans, on paying the interest on ESCOM loans, on municipal loans. We, all that money would come back to us. And it, it has a multiplier effect once we have control of our destiny. Uh, things start to happen, and they happen very rapidly. Uh, you know, if, you, if you go back in the 1930s when Germany took control of its, its money uh, supply, 
I had, in 1933, there were 6 million unemployed. Six years later, they were actually looking for workers. They had to bring in people, uh, elderly retired people, they had to bring in people from foreign countries. Uh, so w one thing I must stress, and this is a, a, a point of hope, you can turn this around very rapidly. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's not a long, drawn-out process. So... Uh, yeah. Well, that's very hopeful there, Stephen Miller. Yes. But when I look at the EFF, sorry, Julian, uh, what they're trying to do, they're actually part of the system, but they're obviously trying to achieve economic freedom. Uh, I think it's a big battle, but you're quite right. Sovereignty is what it's all about. Now, with the BRICS being on stage now and South Africa being part of BRICS, are you saying your statement that it's gonna, it could happen very rapidly, are you saying that within the context of BRICS, or would BRICS be separate from the New World Order agenda, or no, are they just basically more of the same? No, BRICS is part of the New World Order. A BRICS, okay. was, in fact, was proposed, uh, a BRICS bank yeah. was proposed by Goldman Sachs. So, uh, the, you know, and they will be charging interest on their loans. Uh, it's just a sort of a, a diversion to, because the IMF has become so unpopular, and the IMF, of course, is controlled by America because they have the controlling votes, 22%. Uh, they're just trying to deflect a bit of the sort of... Um, concerned by, by the people in those countries, and they've set up this alternative bank. But it's not going to solve anything. So if BRICS is part of the New World Order, that means Russia is part of the New World Order. So what's this NATO-Russia aggression, competition, yes. conflict, <coughs> threatening of new uh, World War Three all about, uh, Stephen? Well, you see, uh, uh, when we had the Cold War, uh, it was partly artificial. But the reason why we had a Cold War was that when they had the Bretton Woods uh, Conference in 1944, yeah. which set up the new uh, monetary system. Russia didn't sign. Stalin refused to, because he realized that he would lose his sovereignty. All right. And uh, he had started to go out on a completely different independent nationalistic line, and that's why they eventually assassinated him. He was poisoned uh, in 1953. But Russia remained, uh, it, had its, it had its own state bank, but because it spent so much money on arms and, 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 and uh, non-essential items, the people never really benefited. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, you had in 1990 when the changeover, everything with the, the Americans came in and they, they applied this shock treatment and they literally cleaned out the country. Uh, you know, all, all the uh, oil companies and everything, they, they, bought, they bought up for, you know, pennies in the pound. And Russia now is <coughs> back to square one. And uh, Russia is also part of the problem because they don't have a, a state bank. They have a central bank, and the central bank controls the Russian economy. That's right, exactly. That's that I found fascinating when I discovered that a while ago. I actually thought they had their own state bank. In they the, had their own know? state bank in up to, it was the was the state bank of the Russian Empire up to nine, from 1861 to 1917, and then it was the Kos Bank, which was the state bank of the Soviet Union up till 1991. There often. Ease, are you still with me or did the line get cut? Hello? Um, something's just happened to our internet connection. That will enable us to uh, re really produce an alternative which they have, they have to concede and they have to acknowledge. Uh, yes. At the moment, they, they've they're, they're still in their comfort zone where they think they can brush everyone aside because they control the media. But the media is changing rapidly. The print media is actually almost dead now. Um, if it wasn't for subsidization, most of the newspapers, a lot of the magazines would have disappeared a long time ago. And yeah. They've always been anti us, except for a very few small exceptions. Yes. Um, so, you know, that, that the, whole, the whole way of communication is, 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 it's been almost a, a paradigm shift. And uh, that will continue to grow, and that will continue to give us hope for, for change. Okay, well. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, like well, stuff we're... like we're doing now, you know, trying to, trying to use the internet to, mm. to get the word out there and connect with people and um, where, where, they, where they are able to connect with us, you know, so that we don't all have to come to one place to have a little meeting. We can just share these chats, you know. Well, it's great, man. I mean, we've learned a lot this evening, Stephen. Thanks for your time. Okay. Is there anything else you want to say, Julian? Oh, well, you know, I've, I could go on for days asking questions uh, in this regard, and, and hopefully Stephen can join us again sometime to um, yeah. 
you know, to actually hopefully have a smoother broadcast <laughs> than than we had this evening. But once in a while, we do have these gremlins that that sneak up on us, and other times they're just unheard of. So, but obviously we 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 doing something good because somebody wants to, you know, put an end to it. <laughs> clearly, so yeah. I think maybe we must have a show just purely on solutions. You know, uh, uh, and we have we have spoken about this in the past. Uh, but it's something we need to focus on, really, in a big way. And maybe we must bring Stephen back on with one or two other guests also and just talk about, you know, really implementation of solutions. I mean, the state bank, the People's Bank, is a major solution if it could be implemented. Yes. Right? Yeah. And that's what Ubuntu uh, basically advocates. That's, that's what Ubuntu was going for. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that was our main plank, and uh, we, we definitely got our message through. I mean, there was a terrific response, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we were cheated by the IEC. And Ubuntu is not going to ah. lose its uh, momentum, or, or what is the no, status on that? I mean, because I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, no, it's definitely, but it's actually growing even faster overseas. I mean, uh, but it's represented in 126 countries now, so it really is a... Uh, really? Yeah, a burst really? movement, yeah. Wow. That's I good didn't news. Know that, that yeah. is fantastic news. I didn't yeah. know that. Okay, well, that's great. Uh, Julian, you want to wrap up? Well, yeah, thank, thanks for being with us again, Stephen. And um, like we said, we could keep on going for days about this. And, and hopefully you can join us at another point And we can maybe, like like Doc, like Faiz said, um, discuss some solutions, you know, and, and, and just hash out some, some of what we think are alternatives because we need to provide alternatives to what we see as problems. Otherwise, we're just uh, pointing fingers. But um, maybe, 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 maybe Stephen can out. You know, a big part of the show could the next show could be Stephen just talking about this People's Bank, what exactly it is, how it will work, etc., uh, etc. Et I don't know if that's a good idea or not. Yeah, well, this is the thing. We can ask our, our listeners. You know, they can give us their feedback. Unfortunately, I mean, we've still got some people that have joined us back again. Um, after all these uh, connection problems and we are intermittently actually connecting at the moment so but people are still there in the wings they can um, tell us what they think of these ideas and, and what they want to discuss next M many people are interested in this topic um, we had a lot of interest in this particular show for this week so yeah we need we need some feedback on on, on in which direction we think we should go so i think we should just play it open-ended until then but thanks for joining us this evening and um thank you as, once again Stephen, for being our, our guest and for sharing some knowledge with us and we'll do this again sometime and sure. uh all the all the listeners and to everybody it will be available as a podcast as a, as a soundcloud and on youtube we'll post it as a video so you can access it there and um, yeah just spread the links spread the word um, keep participating thanks for all your participation on the chat room this evening and good night and Sorry, we'll before you go uh, yeah. can I say something if, yeah. if, uh, yeah. um, sure uh, if, if, if any uh, Julian if anyone wants any more information uh, my books are available locally uh, they can contact that me. Is, that, is, that is interesting how can they also contact you and, and get a hold of your material that is very yes. important uh, sorry yes. that we missed that it's especially valuable for you know if you're a student or studying, uh, because it provides a lot of answers, a lot of a lot of uh, mysteries are solved in the, the two books. The one is the history of central banking, and the enslavement of mankind, and the other one is inside the South African Reserve Bank, its origins and secrets uh, exposed. Um, so if you want to contact me, um, the very reason we priced them for the half the price that they're being advertised on ad Amazon. Uh, so just contact me at uh, Abolish Usury, A-B-O-L-I-S-H. Do you know what we can do, Stephen? We can actually post these links on our page. We can okay, make well, it available on yeah. our page and we can have everybody <coughs> being able to get in contact with you. Okay. Um, and, and have you got anything just like very easy for, for people to follow you on or get hold of you on like a Twitter account or something? That No, I'm not. Uh, um, actually, I actually prefer to not be uh, too directly involved because it distracts me from... Um, on yeah. more important things. So yeah. I'm, I'm not really linked to any uh, uh, social a, media. Yeah, there's a Facebook page you can have a look at. And that is? It's under Stephen Mitford Goodson. Okay. And uh, I think there are about 300 likes, so you can add to that tonight. Uh, Lovely. If you want. But, we'll, but we'll post your email address. Shall we post your email address on our Facebook page? Yes, if you could do that. And, okay. um, and the titles of the books. Uh, okay. We'll do that. So, yeah. I'm sure there may be some people who would who actually benefit from 
you know, what's yeah. contained in there, and they can share them with other people and that and similarly. Yeah, unfortunately, okay. we've, we've lost a lot of people because of all these disconnections we've had. So a lot yep. of people will catch on to this information from the podcast right. and from the recordings that we make. But thanks again. Uh, thanks again for being a, a part of our show. And this is where we're going to basically just round up and say goodnight to everybody and have a good evening. And uh, yeah, keep warm. It's very cold <laughs> these days. Well. <laughs> Thanks, mm-hmm. thanks for being on the show, Stephen. It was really great to have you, brother. Appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot. Take care, man. Pleasure. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. You're listening to Zidane Talk Radio.